Our speaker this morning is not a stranger to explore. Many of you have heard him speak at other global and regional conferences. He is a professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology and serves as a co-chair for education for the Electronic Document Systems Foundation. All right, he made me carry these out here. On one hand, he and his son Richard wrote the Encyclopedia of Graphic communi Communications, and I think it weighs more than me. It has over 10,000 terms, and the American Library Association calls it the standard reference in the field. Then on the other hand, and those of you who know Frank, he has this book of jokes called Desktop Follies. Of his 33 books, he has covered personalized printing, on-demand printing, and digital prepress. He wrote the first book on Quark Express, and in a week, his book on Adobe InDesign will be out. He founded Electronic Publishing Magazine 23 years ago. He co-edits The Pocket Pal. If you read the printing entries in the World Book of Britannica, he wrote them. When asked what his goal in life was, he said to educate students who will change the world. I give you Frank Romano. All right, I owe you a dollar. Thank Frank, you very Frank, much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. This talk is an e-talk. It's eclectic. There is actually no moral to it. It is also PowerPointless. I'm here in LA this week because Grauman's Chinese wanted to immortalize my lips in cement permanently. There was this guy sitting on the sidewalk on Hollywood Boulevard with an old laptop computer and a sign saying, we'll host website for food. So I took out my Palm Pilot and beamed him an e-buck. And I noticed everyone here is device happy. They have cell phones and pagers and PDAs and Palm Pilots. Some people look like they're wearing Batman's utility belt. Quick Robin to the Bat Printer. And there are so many models. Do you realize that the abacus hasn't changed in 3,000 years? However, if it was the Apple operating system, AOS, it would be at revision level 3,000, 0.6, 1. And if it was developed by Microsoft, Abacus 2000, it would perform every function known to man except actually do math. Recently, Johann Gutenberg was named the person of the millennium because he invented the information age. Truth be told, the first time he printed a sheet, he got an error message. Font not found. <laughs> Substituting courier. Revolutions are now commonplace. They're televised on CNBC. They're webcast. Every day we read about how they've put more transistors on a chip, accelerated processor speed, increased the memory capacity of RAM, upped the storage of magnetic disks, improved the resolution of displays, doubled the speed of modems, expanded bandwidth, and made everything smaller and cheaper at the same time. This is un-American. Things are supposed to get bigger and more expensive. But there's a kicker. Virtually every device that's electronic is obsoleted every 18 months. The hardware gets more powerful, so the OS gets more powerful, so the application software gets more powerful, which requires more hardware power and then more OS power in a never-ending cycle of more, more, more. It sounds like a bad porno novel. Only, time, only this time, we're the ones getting, well, you know what. We are constantly upgrading hardware and software. This is not why I was put on Earth. Computers were supposed to make my life easier. The tendency for computing power to increase with a corresponding price decrease every 18 months is called Moore's Law, right? There is also the tendency on the part of the user to just want to hurl their computers in the air. This is called Mary Tyler Moore's Law. And the bard wrote, you'll be sorry you came to this session. I've got megabytes of memory and gigahertz of speed, but no matter how much I have, there's always more I need. I've got megabytes of RAM and mega MIPS galore, but even with all that, I'm still in need of more. My hardware cost keeps climbing, my software cost, oh my. I guess I'll still be buying until the day I die. And when I reach the pearly gates, it'll be just like before. 
an infinity of upgrades, an eternity of more. Joe Bard. I come from an industry where you acquire this mechanical device called a printing press and you keep it running for 20 years. Well, the world is changing. The quest for faster and faster also applies to information and especially print. We want our data faster, our information sooner. We want instant knowledge. Someday they will have little knowledge pills shaped like books. I still read print and I don't see that habit changing for a long time. But I must admit that I now expect news to be electronic and the in-depth commentary and technology review, review to be print. I'm of a generation that was raised on print and now works with computers. I guess I'm bitextual. Think about how you are all now located. Your business card and stationery have addresses, both mail and physical location, fax and phone numbers, email addresses, both company and personal, as in stud at AOL.com, or others like pager numbers. They're all different, and they're all the ways that someone can find you no matter where you are. If someone does not respond, it's not that they didn't get the message, they just don't like you. I subscribe to a digital forum where users and suppliers ask questions online. They, they comment, they debate, they argue about subjects that I care about. It's like a cyber town hall. There's a little time in between the messages to reflect before making comments. I personally read the Wall Street Journal online. I don't get the printed version anymore. $69 a year, I find it worthwhile. That's one less copy that's printed. Sorry, not my fault. Now there are 400,000 subscribers, and that may be 400,000 copies that are not printed anymore. I read the New York Times, the trade press, and other media that have websites. Many times, I print the material out. For years, we have spoken about distribute and print. Well, we have distribute and print. It's the internet. On any printer you want, big or small, print the stuff out. Adobe Acrobat now lets you capture a website as a PDF. On one hand, it eliminates paper, but on the other hand, it makes it easier for you to print that website out. I search the web like a giant filing cabinet. I deal with artists who send PDFs of art for review and students who submit their lessons electronically. Last night, one of my classes turned in all their final reports. Kids have fewer excuses. Since there are hundreds of computers in many labs at RIT, there's always somewhere they can go. They can't say, my computer's not working. However, I'm waiting for someone to tell me that the dog ate their modem. I buy software, flowers, greeting cards on the web. I book hotels and rental cars. I teach via distance learning and have cyber lessons. To paraphrase something Captain Kirk said in one of those Star Trek movies, I live in the world of print, but increasingly work in cyberspace. I'm a cyber commuter. Computers are everywhere and are even being used to teach sex education in, in the U.S., according to US, World, U.S. News and World Report. The interactive programs teach teenagers about the birds and the bees with rams and roms. One kid was somewhat confused trying to put a condom on a mouse. <laughs> My cheapskate HMO recommends Norton Utilities for medical checkups. People send me email telling me to call them or asking if their fax was received. I've never gotten a fax asking me if I've received someone's voice with mail message. There's an irony in all this as we try to balance snail mail, junk mail, fax mail, voicemail, email, inter-office paper mail. The idea that somehow all that paper could disappear is hard to accept. I cannot picture clean desktops. In the future, there may be com companies who will come in and decorate your desk with piles of paper instead of plants. In the future, this conference could be virtual. When I travel, I routinely plug my computer, my power book, into a phone jack at a hotel or Amtrak lounge. I'm connected, wired, online. A wireless modem is next, and I will be free to connect anywhere, except maybe in tunnels. For years, paper piled up on my desk and I fooled myself into thinking I knew where everything was. Now, my email is piles of files in a folder and I still fool myself into thinking I know where everything is. Only now, I have a way of searching through all that stuff. 
Occasionally, I print the email and pile it on my desk, which has as much or more paper as before. The reason may be nostalgic. I just heard somebody's cell phone. If that's for me, I'm out. The in-out baskets are pretty much gone, and so is the old-time male boy and later male girl. Some companies now use robotic carts that travel from office to office and ring a bell for some Pavlovian response as folks rush to the mail cart. It just gives them a reason to get out of their cubicles, I think. Much of what I do and you do now lives in the computer. Data storage is my life. Romano's law. Data expands to fill the storage space available. I started with single-sided floppies and filled them to capacity. Then came double and quad density, double-sided floppies, and I filled them up. I jumped to a 40 megabyte rigid disk and filled it to the rim. Then I went to 20 megabytes and 40 megabytes and 250 megabytes, and I filled them too. I had a 500 megabyte disk and I filled it up. Now I have an 8 gigabyte hard disk and it's going fast. I need Weight Watchers for data. Stop me before I record on your disk. And talk about existing only as data. The military is now replacing a, sale, a soldier's dog tags with small flash memory cards that are worn around the neck. This will come in handy during war. Instead of relying on messy torture, a captor can now simply hack a prisoner's name, rank, and serial number. Hypertext is being hyped as information in all four dimensions. This means that a computer can actually access data that is backward or forward in time. You can read memos that you write tomorrow, today, and change what you predicted yesterday to match the results of tomorrow. Yeah. This is the perfect tool for the corporate office. You can get your work done yesterday by people who are out then but will start today because they're off tomorrow. Right. Getting information is now almost instantaneous. First, there were the messengers that ran between Athens and Sparta, and the couriers who connected the Roman Empire, and the U.S. mail. There was Pony Express. Spe special delivery got us mail delivery faster. Then the telegraph dits and, dits and does, which Morse wrought. And the teletype, which printed the messages out. Then the bus, same-day pouches, got the material through. Airline, same-day pouches, service to the airport. Then came Federal Express, and next-day delivery, right to you. We have fax and email to get us messages almost instantly. What comes next? email that goes back in time so that you can receive your messages before you send them. We enter the ex-FedEx age. Just think, in 150 years, we went from the steam engine to the search engine. The next, the next era, mind link, futurists predict. This means that we may have mind-to-mind -mind facts. You're sitting there and paper starts to exit from your pocket. The next big acquisition for AT&T, you heard it here first. They're buying the psychic hotline. Mind links will require a new form of message dialing. Genetically implanted cell phones. Just think of another mind's number. Forget the number, just recall what they look like, and the holographic mind link directory finds them. There'll still be busy signals and wrong mind numbers. If there's no answer, the party is dead. For privacy, you can get an unlisted mind, but those computer calls will still get through. You yourself will become the ultimate mobile phone. At Broadway shows, they will announce that you should turn yourself off. One day, we will see palm pilots that literally fit surgically in your palm. At networking events like this, a simple handshake will beam contact information from person to person. We won't be communicating, we'll be communicable. All machines are shrinking. Honey, I shrunk the world. Computers are getting so small that they will be implanted in people. It might not be unusual to go to a maintenance depot and see a batch of people sitting around with tags hanging from their ears as they wait to be serviced. Actually, it's just my, my HMO is that works that way. Within the next 50 years, robots will pass the threshold of humankind abilities with miniaturization down to the atomic level. Robots will transcend the term intelligence as we understand it today. They will become our companions, workmates, and heirs. I think this is going to happen. Therefore, I've decided to leave all my worldly possessions to my microwave. 
who will take care of the blender and the toaster. However, I have disinherited the TV set and the lawnmower for reasons most people would understand. The New York Times said that we are not far away from creating artificial life. They said that computer viruses are just an extension of humanity into the electronic world. That ultimately machines will be people and people will be machines. Instead of saying I'm wearing a digital watch, the watch will say I'm wearing a digital person. As computers take over more and more of the work of human beings, what will be left for us to do? Throw the switch to off.